Hello Woodford Forest Shul, I hope everyone is well and is coping okay. Your very esteemed rabbi, Rabbi Wallenberg, asked me to share a few thoughts about the upcoming festival of Shavuot, so here I am. Uh, a question that I've often found puzzling about Shavuot relates to Har Sinai, Mount Sinai. To me there's something quite perplexing about how we in Judaism relate to this mountain. This is a small mountain in the middle of the desert on which the Torah was given to the Jewish people by God over Shavuot. On the one hand, this mountain is supremely holy. It was so holy that at the time of the giving of the Torah, nobody was allowed to go up the mountain to climb it apart from Moshe and Moses. None of the Jewish people were even allowed to touch it. And for this purpose, a fence was set up around the mountain. This makes sense. After all, this was the holiest event in Jewish history. More actually, it was the holiest event in the history of the world. The revelation of God to the Jewish people and the giving of the Torah. What, however, is perplexing to us is that despite the holiness that Mount Sinai has at the time of the giving of the Torah, today the mountain doesn't seem to have any holiness to us at all. It seems confusing. On the one hand, it's a very holy mountain. On the other hand, it's not holy at all. There are lots of holy places in our tradition. Holiest of all is the site of the Bet HaMikdash, of where the first and second temple stood in Jerusalem. And the remaining wall of it that is nearest, nearest to the Holy of Holies, what's known as the Kotel Hamaravi, or the Western Wall. There are other holy places in our tradition. They include the city of Hebron, known in English as Hebron, where there's Ma'arat Hamach Pela, the burial place of many of our patriarchs and matriarchs, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Leah, and also many other cities and towns in Israel that are holy in Judaism. However, nowhere on our list of holy sites in Judaism does Mount Sinai appear. It doesn't seem to make sense. To compound the question even further, we don't even know where Mount Sinai actually is today and which mountain it was. There is a, is, there is a mountain in the Sinai Desert, which in Arabic is known as Jabal Musa, which translates literally into English as Moses' mountain. Based on this, there are many Christian and Muslim traditions which hold this to be Mount Sinai. However, in our Jewish tradition, we don't seem to have any evidence that this is actually the correct mountain. And even if it is, our tradition isn't concerned about finding out whether it is or it isn't. Even if this is the correct location of Mount Sinai, this mountain doesn't seem to have any holiness to us as Jewish people. The question is, why? I think for some people, <coughs> holiness, spirituality, closeness to God is about one-off events of revelation and inspiration. That moment where you feel a spark, where there's a fire igniting within you, an out-of-this-world spiritual experience. And that's great. But to be honest, I'm not sure if that's what real holiness actually is. That is the Mount Sinai experience. Standing there in the middle of a calm and otherwise barren desert, with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of other people, and suddenly hearing loud blasts of the shofar, thunder, lightning, the deafening voice of the revelation of God. That is certainly spiritual, and that's certainly very, very holy. But perhaps spirituality and holiness, which comes as easily and as quickly as a flash of lightning and a crash of thunder, can also leave us as quickly as a flash of lightning and a crash of thunder. With this in mind, is it that surprising that only a short while after this great historic revelation, the Jewish people seemingly worshipped a golden calf? <clears throat> Holiness and spirituality that comes quickly can also unfortunately leave us very quickly as well. <clears throat> There's a fascinating story later in the Tanakh later in the Bible, in the book of Kings, about the famed prophet Eliyahu, or in English, Elijah. Fleeing for his life from an idolatrous regime that is persecuting and wants to kill him, he flees into the desert and travels for 40 days and spends the night in a cave at Mount Sinai. God comes to him and, and this is actually a well-known uh, Jewish song from a number of years ago by the Mammy Boys Choir, God comes to him and says to him, Malachapo Eliyahu, what are you doing here, Elijah? 
God is seemingly surprised, perhaps almost angry, that Elijah has decided of all places to go to Mount Sinai. We don't have really enough time to go into the, into detail into this fascinating, deep and meaningful story. To do justice to it could take hours. The meaningful story that happens here. But Elijah has come to Mount Sinai. I don't think this is a coincidence. He's come to the place of thunder, of lightning, of loud noise and of God's revelation. And suddenly, Elijah experiences, we're told in the book of Kings, Elijah experiences what in Hebrew we're told is a ruach gedolah v'chazak, a great and powerful wind that is so strong it breaks up mountains and crashes stones. And then God replies to him after he's experienced this really strong and powerful wind with some very famous but surprising words. God says to him, Lo v'ruach Hashem, God isn't in the wind. After, God, after Elijah's experience, this, this strong wind which God has created, God turns to him and says, I'm not in that wind. God isn't in the wind. Next thing that happens is Elijah experiences a ra'ash. The Hebrew word is ra'ash, which can either be understood to mean a very, very heavy noise or a kind of thunder or perhaps an earthquake. And then God immediately afterwards says to Elijah, Lo ra'ash Hashem. God isn't in the thunder or God isn't in the earthquake. Then straight afterwards, there's a massive fire. And then God also says to Elijah, Lo va'esh Hashem. God cannot be found in the fire. And then straight afterwards, we're told there is a kold mama daka, a thin, quiet sound. And at that moment, after the thin, quiet sound, Elijah gets up and goes out of the cave and re-encounters God once again and continues on his God-given mission. God isn't always to be found in the thunder, the lightning, the earthquakes, the loud noise and the cataclysmic events, the ones we experienced at Mount Sinai. But God can also be found in the cold mamadaka, in the quiet events, and at the quiet moments as well. Contrary to belief that many people have, true spirituality isn't necessarily attained by those flash of inspiration and those flash of holiness moments. They happen and they're important, but they often go and leave us just as quickly as they came. I believe that true spirituality is attained when we work hard for something, when we actively chase holiness and spirituality, and when we work hard for it. If we've worked hard for something, then it won't leave us that quickly. That is is long-term, sustainable, real spirituality. Real, long-term, sustainable spirituality won't be found in the thunder and the lightning at a mountain in the desert, but rather in the hours, the days and the years of serious Torah study. And, just as importantly, in the hours, the days and the years of acts of chesed, loving kindness, doing kindness and good deeds for our family, our friends, the wider community and wider society. This is one of the reasons why the location of Mount Sinai isn't relevant for us in the Jewish tradition. Mount Sinai was important and is important, but it's about thunder, it's about lightning, fire and earthquakes. But the message for Elijah the prophet and for each of us is that true, real, sustainable spirituality is not really about that, but about the hard work and the effort that each and every one of us put in every single day and every single minute and every single hour into obtaining our real spiritual growth. I hope that you all have a wonderful and enjoyable Shavuot, and I wish all of us that we are able to have many months and years of real, long-term spiritual growth. I hope you have a wonderful Shavuot.